Local historian Janet Thompson thinks that Workington Library has a photograph of the hotel in its archive. Yes, that's an old view of the station as it was, and it was to this, it was just here. to here. I'm not sure whether it's in this issue. Oh, the one I've got. Okay. Um, there we are, Station Hotel. It looks very bleak. Before its demolition, the Station Hotel was a run-down social club. But when Sue's great-grandparents ran the hotel, business was booming. When the railways really flourished, so did the hotel. At one time, it had nine bedrooms, all the say, but accommodation facilities were reduced and finally abandoned in 1972. But the Station Hotel was small in comparison to James's next hotel. By the time of the 1891 census, he was running the Globe, just along the coast in Whitehaven. Duke Street. Right. Yeah. That's it. James Cowan, there. I'll move it on a little bit. 107 Duke Street, it was, it's sort of on a, a corner of Duke Street and Strand Street, but it, it really is a, 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 a posh place, oh. yes, oh yes, I think you'd be proud of Excuse it. Excuse me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if you just, How the magi yeah. have fallen. Um, so there, there is. <laughs> right, these are some of the servants here, Margaret Dryden, Lottie Nelson, Jane A. Little, little servant. They're all single, these girls, Margaret Wilson, Susan Howard. From that amount of staff, because I should think those were the ones that were only the ones that were living in. There'd be other staff coming in from outside, so it, it does look as if it's a big establishment, mm. doesn't it? Yeah. Today, the Globe has been converted into flats and a shop. Sue's great-grandfather James was in his 60s by the time he was running hotels. To go further back into his past, Sue needs to talk to her cousin Pauline, who's always been interested in the family's history. A few years ago, she drew up a family tree with her mother, another of Alf's six daughters. It has new information about James and his wife Elizabeth. She worked, I think, as a manageress in the tea rooms at the station, I presume Carlisle, and that's really? where our great grandfather would have met her, I presume. Because uh, he was the uh, uh, station, station master, master uh, at Workington. Uh, uh, no, uh, at Carlisle. Carlisle. Oh, that's quite grand. Yeah, but uh, I presume that's where he met her. I wonder why she didn't want Grandpa to go on the railways. Maybe she saw enough and well, thought she was... she'd married into. She thought some money and. You know, go hoity-toity. <laughs> Sue's never seen a photograph of her great-grandfather, James, but a clear picture of him is now emerging. Given that he had this important job of being station master at a very prestigious station like Carlisle, and that he then went on to uh, run the Globe Hotel, which was pretty impressive. I'm just getting the picture of a very well-established and uh, probably quite well-to-do Victorian gentleman. The National Archives in London holds records of Carlisle Station committee meetings during the time James Cowan worked there. Oh! <laughs> this has got James Cowan written here. Porter. Application for advance of wages to 18 shillings a week. Resolved. That the application be declined. Oh, bless him until his term of five years' service has expired. Porter. I wouldn't have expected Porter, really, because that suggests to me very menial work. 
And it's funny to think that they're now writing about him at 18 and he can't have his increase and soon he's going to be quite powerful. James began his working life as a station porter in 1850. 11 years later, he was promoted to second assistant platform superintendent and again in 1871 to foreman. Oh. Oh. This is interesting. John Robley appointed foreman in place of James Cowan resigned. He's left. He never was station master. Ah. Oh. That's a myth, it's, it's a myth. <gasps> 76, 25 years after he started. I wonder why he resigned. Sue's traveling back up north to try and find out if James's reason for leaving the railways had something to do with his hostility to his son Alf then joining the railways 30 years later. When James Cowan worked at Carlisle, it was the largest station outside London. 300 trains passed through daily. Although a porter was expected to work long hours for low pay, it was the first rung on the ladder to station management. For many, it was a job for life. Dennis Perriam, is a local historian with a particular interest in Carlisle Station. Dennis, was it usual to take years to get promotion? Because my great-grandfather seemed to take 10 years before he moved from Porter to Foreman. Yeah, William Jameson, who began at the station in 1847, took 41 years to become a station superintendent. 41. So it was possible to rise through the ranks and become superintendent. And he remained in the job for 50, 50 years. He worked here for 50 years, both Porter and higher up as well. So there wasn't a retirement day? No, if go. you became station superintendent, you were in that job for life. Sue's looking back through the records of Carlisle Station to see if she can now work out why James resigned. In October 75, there was a replacement for Mr Thomas Jones, who'd just died, and he was the superintendent at that point. And a new appointment was made here that Mr Preston would become the station master. And interestingly enough, here, in 1876, James Cowan resigned. So suddenly, what, October? A year later, after this, I think is, is realised that that's it. He's never going to make the top grade. So in 25 years, James achieved just moderate promotion on the railways. But that doesn't explain why he was so opposed to Alf following in his footsteps. Sue's hoping the 1851 census can provide further information about James's personal life. James Cowan living in Old Bush Lane in Carlisle at the age of 25. And he was born in Scotland. Well, fancy that. I've got Scottish blood in me. I always knew I had, always knew. Old Bush Lane, 84 Old Bush Lane. Well, I haven't a clue where that is, but it'd be nice to find out, wouldn't it? It'd be lovely to see if it's, oh, it wouldn't be still standing, would it? Old Bush Lane has been demolished, but librarian Stephen White has a map of Carlisle from 1900. Right, that's the large-scale map, and right at the top is Old Bush Lane. Oh, right, so what sort of housing would it be? Well, I think it was fairly dire, you know. Fairly dire. People living on top of each other. In fact, I can uh, I'll show you this. He's going. I asked him what kind of. Um, property it would be and he's shot off inspired show me something and those are some actually uh, they were taken before the lanes are demolished oh, these are some Bush small Lane. yeah these are actually I'll give you some idea and that's oh. an artist 
where they would have lived. And there's, a, there's a letter in the paper, actually, 1865 there, which is referring to the conditions in Crown and Anchor Lane, which is just two lanes down, so, so I suppose the conditions there would have been very similar. I solicit the aid of your column in drawing attention to the sanitary condition of a part of the Crown and Anchor Lane. For some time past, the, the stench arising from the piggeries, the slaughterhouses, etc., has been almost overpowering. Yet more than one family eat and sleep surrounded by such an atmosphere. Oh. They lived in terrible conditions. The lanes of Carlisle were where the working classes lived, and by the 1850s, overcrowding was a big problem. The railways had brought the city out of isolation. The population had doubled as people flocked from rural communities looking for work. Nearly 10,000 people lived in these narrow streets. Malnutrition, disease, and death were rife. It's really strange because it you know these conditions existed, you have studied history and you think you know, but it really is extraordinary when it's your family. It just really brings history not just to life, but it personalises it, that this, the people lived in this squalor, but I've now tracked it back to know that my family lived in these conditions. It sort of makes it very real. It's almost like you feel you, as your history is revealed, that you sort of think, oh, that makes sense. That's, that's where I've come from then. That's why I react to things the way I do, because that's my history. Do you know what I mean? Sort of really, it's me, this route. It's all about what's handed down, what comes through, not genetic, just genetically, but, oh, I don't know, maybe sound crass, but I feel, you know, that because I'm a socialist and because I've always cared about that injustice of the working classes and, and always had a love of Scotland, <laughs> that maybe that's what my past is revealing, where all that comes from.